Let's talk about the amygdala. All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're gonna focus on the amygdala. Now, from the introduction, you already probably got a good sense of at least one of its major functions, which is detecting a threat in the environment. Now, I can't say this about all the parts of the brain, but you can actually have some pretty good discussions and debates amongst your peers about the amygdala. Like, what actually constitutes a threat, right? How does your brain know what it should be afraid of, right? What poses danger to us and what it can overlook? Or when it comes to spiders, as you saw on my shoulder, is this something that our brain is wired to fear, right, for millions of years along with snakes and, and, and fear of heights? Or is this a learned condition response? So we'll touch on a few of these discussions and debates in this video, but that's something you can think about at home. Now in this video, we're gonna focus on really two big things. One is the four functions of the amygdala. And we'll also touch on some animal research, like how do we actually know about the function of the amygdala and what it does? So we'll touch on that as well. The first thing I want to do, though, is start with this general structure right here. Let's just make sure we know what we're looking at, uh, and this will help us develop some background knowledge. Now, I've actually highlighted the amygdala already. Okay, you'll notice it's this tiny circle structure right here. It's actually in the shape of an almond, which is why they call it the amygdala. And let's write that in right here. Amygdala. And the amygdala is located deep within our temporal lobes. All right, so let's do a little review of our lobes. We have our frontal lobe. We can remember that because it's in the front of our head. We have our temporal lobes on the sides, and we remember that because it's close to our temples. We have our parietal lobe, which sits on top of our head, and our occipital lobe, which is in the back of the head. Okay, so that's a nice way to think about it. Now remember, I said lobes, plural, which should tell you that we have two amygdala, all right, one on each side. So we have two amygdalas, we have two hippocampus, we have two thalamus. That's always important to know because we always see structures like this that looks like, you know, just this one cross section. But remember, we have two hemispheres, which means we have two of each structure. Now, another way to think about the amygdala is that it's a part of structures in an area called the limbic system. So a lot of these structures here are part of what we call the limbic system. Okay, now what is the limbic system and why are they all part of the same system? Well, the limbic system usually involves two things, emotions and memories, okay? So all these structures here typically deal with something, whether it's emotions or memories. So we have the thalamus, we have the amygdala, we have the hippocampus right here, we have the hypothalamus. So with the hypothalamus, that's also the endocrine system. So it controls more automatic things. But if you ever read something in a psych textbook and it talks about the emotional center of our brain, 10 out of 10 times, they're talking about this area I'll pull a little arrow here that we call the limbic system, okay? So that's a nice way to think about that. So the next question becomes, how do we actually know what the amygdala does? Well, a lot of it comes down to animal research. And for my animal lovers, you're not gonna like this, but a lot of times we do research on animals, right? And you might say, well, why do we do it on humans? Well, according to the IRB, right, Institu Institutional Review Board, you know, it's a little easier uh, and more ethical to do it on animals than humans. So how do we actually know what the amygdala does? Well, there's a procedure called lesioning, okay? You could also call it deep lesioning, where essentially what happens is you put a thin wire and you insert it into the brain of an animal, right? Now this typically be, you know, in psych research, it could be lab rats or rhesus monkeys. Those are the two animals that are typically done. And what lesioning or deep lesioning means essentially is you damage or remove a part of the brain, okay? And whatever part that's damaged, you can call a lesion, right? So here's what I want you to think about. If I deep lesion, right, if I damage or remove the amygdala, what would happen to the rats? What would happen to the, the rhesus monkey or you, right? If, you're, if your amygdala is damaged, what would be the consequences? Well, thinking about what we already know now, there could be two consequences. One, there's essentially a reduction in a fear response, right? I'm not gonna say that there's no fear, but it's gonna be diminished or reduced. Uh, that fight or flight response won't necessarily be there. What we'll also see is a reduction in aggression. Okay, reduction in aggression. All right, so those are two symptoms or side effects of what we see when it comes to lesioning in animals. Now, what you would also do is the opposite. What if you stimulate that part of the brain? What if you take an electrode and you stimulate the amygdala? Well, you'll see the opposite. 
you'll see the rat becoming aggressive, right? You'll see the rat attacking another rat, or they might become more fearful. So that's kind of how we know what the amygdala does. You either remove or destroy that part of the brain and see what happens, or you stimulate that part of the brain. And for a lot of research in psych, right, that's how it comes down to. You, you observe a damaged area. Okay. All right. So now that we have basic knowledge of the amygdala, where it's located, uh, what system it's a part of, and how we know it's a function, let's actually get to specific functions. Okay. And the first one we're going to talk about is actually detecting, and as we talked about earlier, is that it's good at detecting a threat. Okay. Now, as I said before, though, what actually constitutes a threat, right? Now, from an evolutionary perspective, it's something that causes us danger. It's something that's going to impede on our survival, right? But realize, it's the year 2021, okay? So there's a lot of things that aren't attacking us, right? We don't have to worry about going outside and a, a woolly mammoth attacks us. So what we find today is oftentimes we're afraid of things that aren't where we shouldn't be afraid of, right? It's a threat, and our brain thinks it's a threat, but it's not, right? In psychology, we often call this the amygdala hijack. Okay, now what is amygdala hijack? Essentially what it means is that our frontal lobe, right, this is where logic and rational thoughts take place, gets overwhelmed by the amygdala. In other words, your emotions take over logic, okay? That's why people are afraid of public speaking, right? That's not really a threat to you. You're not going to get harmed public speaking, but your amygdala does know that, right? Your amygdala thinks that you're actually in danger, and this takes over the rational part of our brain. But for this purpose, let's imagine that we actually do have a threat, okay? A spider's on top of you, it just landed on you, and yeah, that's going to be pretty freaky. So we're going to say that's a real threat. So how does our brain react or detect this threat? Well, remember, our eye actually doesn't see the spider. I know that might sound weird, right? Our eye is just picking up light waves, right? So we have this stimulus right here, our spider, okay? And let's think about parts of the eye, some background knowledge. We have our cornea and our lens and our pupil and our iris. And then where does it eventually go? Well, what's going to happen is this light is going to end up on the back of the eye, right, that we call the retina. And this is where transduction occurs. Now, let's think about transduction. This happens in all of our senses. It's where one type of energy converts into another type of energy, right? So it's light waves converting into electrical impulses or action potentials. Whether we're talking about hearing, that would be sound waves converting into electrical impulses. Everything in our body comes in as an energy, and then we have to convert it to action potentials, right? Electricity. So that information is going to travel up the optic nerve, right? Optic nerve would be the eye, and the auditory nerve would be the ear, okay? And then where's that information going to go, right? Where are the action potentials going to go? Well, all this information, everything from our senses, goes to the same place. It's going to go to a part of the brain called the thalamus, okay? except smell, okay? All the senses go to the thalamus except for smell. We'll touch on that in another video, okay? Now, what happens after that? Well, there's two things. First, there's going to be a direct pathway from the thalamus to our amygdala, okay? So it's going to synapse and communicate with our amygdala. And then what's also going to happen is, because it's vision, that information has to reach the visual cortex of the brain, right? So it's also going to synapse and go to the back of the brain that we call the visual cortex, right, with the occipital lobus, right there. So really there's two things that are happening, right? We've detected the stimulus, and there's two parts it goes to. The amygdala, that's a direct pathway, and the occipital lobus. Here's what's interesting. Which comes first, right? Does the information go to the cortex first, where we think about what we, what's happening, or does it go to the amygdala first? The answer is the latter. It goes to the amygdala first. So what does that tell us? It tells us that when there's danger, your body reacts before you're even consciously aware that it's happening, right? How cool is that? We could thank evolution for that one, right? If a car is coming at us, right, you jump out of the way before you even realize that it's a car coming at you, right? Think about if you had to actually think about it first, right? If there's a car coming at me, what color car is it, right? If you have to think about it, we're not going to survive. So what's cool about this detection system, it's kind of like an early warning signal, is that your body's going to react, it's like a reflex, and then it reaches the cortex and you think about what is happening. So you don't even know it's a spider until after you've kind of jumped out of the way. So that's kind of really cool to think about when it comes to detecting a threat. All right, let's go to our second function, which we're going to talk about, which is triggering, trigger a body response. Okay, I'm just going to write bot, 
trigger a response. So what does this mean? Now that we have the early warning sign, I always think of this like a bat signal, right? You know, like everything's ready to go. Well, then your body has to respond to this danger, okay? Whether it's slapping the spider, whether it is jumping out of the way of a car, you know, whatever it is, it has to be some sort of response. Now, we could think about this a few ways, but I'm actually going to come here and talk about the fight or flight response, okay? And the way we're going to do this is think about, okay, now the information is in my brain, okay? How does my body react? Now, many of you at home, you know this feeling, right? Sweating, right? Perspiration, or your heart's beating really quickly, or you feel dizzy, right? You know those, those, those reactions. But what is the actual order in which it occurs to respond to this threat? So let's start with the first one. Let's say, I'll use a different pen. Let's say there is a threat, right? That's always got to be the first one, okay? There's got to be a threat, and in this case, it's going to be a spider. Okay, well, what happens next? Well, after that, as we already talked about, it's going to go to our amygdala, okay? Direct pathway from our thalamus to our amygdala. Amygdala. Now realize, I didn't say cortex yet, right? Because you haven't even thought about it yet. So I'm gonna have a little, kind of like a little sidebar here that says cortex. In other words, after it goes to the amygdala, that's when you're gonna realize, oh, this is a spider, right? After the reflex occurs. All right, so what happens after the amygdala? Well, it's gonna go to a region, and I'm gonna highlight it using green, a region of the brain called the hypothalamus. This is a cool structure. The hypothalamus does everything, right? If you think about one structure of the brain that plays a role in everything, the hypothalamus is that. I always think of it like the conductor of an orchestra, right? It kind of does this, says, okay, pituitary gland, I want you to go. Okay, hormones, I want you to release, right? It controls everything. So that's going to be our next structure, which is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Okay. Now, this is where things start. This is where things are going to start to kind of release into our bloodstream and we're going to start having some hormones being released to kind of create that fight or flight response. So we have our hypothalamus. Oops, hypothalamus. And then this is going to lead to our master gland that we call the pituitary gland. Now, as I'm listing these, I'm realizing, you know, a lot of this happens simultaneously. Right, things happen so quickly in our body, you could say this all happens at the same time. But listening out like this, I think it's just a really good way to stay organized and structure our thinking, okay? All right, so we have our threat, which signals the amygdala, which then will signal the cortex to be consciously aware of it, which will then trigger the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which will then lead to our major gland, which kind of controls all of this stress and leads to threat, which is what we call the adrenal glands. Okay, adrenal, and you have two of them above our kidneys on both sides, okay? All right, so here we go. This is the nice structure to think about uh, when it comes to the flight or flight response. Actually, I'm gonna add one more thing in there. I'm actually gonna delete that. I'm gonna erase that for a second. Here's a better one. First, let's go to our system. Let's go to our sympathetic, there we go. I was like, I knew I was missing one. Our sympathetic nervous system. That's much better. Now our sympathetic nervous system is really what we think about for fight or flight response. It's part of our autonomic nervous system, which is also part of our peripheral nervous system. And this is gonna kind of set the cascade of hormones. Then we have our adrenal gland. There we go, that's much better. I knew I was missing one. We have our adrenal. Okay, our adrenal glands, okay? This is the structure of how it works. Now, what are the hormones that our adrenal glands gonna produce to make we have that kind of fight or flight response? We have a few of them, and I want you to think about these at home. We have our norepinephrine, right? That's gonna kind of produce that fight or flight uh, feeling. We have adrenaline, also called uh, epinephrine, and we have cortisol, right, the stress hormone. So norepinephrine, cortisol, uh, adrenaline or epinephrine, those are the, prim the primary three that are going to lead to this, this fight or flight response. Now, another way to think about this, you might have heard this expression, something called the HPA axis. Okay, now what does that mean? This is kind of a general phrase to explain, you know, what our body does when there's a threat. And why do they call it the HPA axis? H is for hypothalamus, P is for pituitary, and A is for adrenal. Hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal, the HPA axis. That's another way to think about this fight or flight response, okay? All right, so we've detected a threat. Our body's responded. We've released those hormones into the brain, right? Heart's pumping. 
the lungs have opened up so you could breathe better. Uh, blood has rushed to my arms so I could punch harder. They rush to my legs so I could kick or, or run faster, right? That kind of happens. Our pupils get bigger, right? This is all evolution, right? Millions of years, your body's prepared you for this, right? Even though we're not fighting, you know, a woolly mammoth, we're still, your brain doesn't know that it's the year 2021. Your body still prepares as if it's in real, real danger, okay? Okay, so what's another response? Um, let's go with what we call fear conditioning, okay? This is an interesting one. Now, when you hear the word conditioning, you know what I think about? I think about behavioral perspective. I think about B.F. Skinner, and I think about Ivan Pavlov, right? Classical conditioning. Now, let's think about what we know about Pavlov and classical conditioning, right? We have a dog salivating to the sound of a bell, right? Very classical study of, of conditioning, right? And what he found was, is that if you have a neutral stimulus, like a tone, and you pair it with an unconditioned stimulus, like meat, and you pair them together, you know, tone, meat, tone, meat, tone, meat, the dog will eventually salivate at the sound of the tone, which will become a conditioned stimulus, right? I know there's a lot of vocab in there, but let's think about Pavlovian terms. And this is what our amygdala essentially does, which is, even though our, our amygdala is right here, it's right next to a part of a brain that deals with memory. And that's the structure right here. That's called the hippocampus, okay? And I'll shade the hippocampus in right here, okay? So these connect to each other. They coordinate with each other, right? They communicate with each other. Our hippocampus and our amygdala coordinate with each other, okay? So what do we mean by fear conditioning? Well, if you've ever been in a, tra a traumatic experience, right? Well, your brain is gonna form associations, right? If you were in a car accident, for example, you might not only be afraid or uh, be afraid of that car, of that, of that accident, but you also might have a conditioned response to just seeing the car, right? Or you see the car on the road and all of a sudden your heart starts to pound. Your brain has formed an association and a memory of that event. That's what we mean by fear conditioning. Now, how can we think about this in terms of conditioning terms? And we talked about animal research before. Well, let's do it up here, right? We have our unconditioned stimulus, let's say is going to be our noise, okay, so we're doing a little rat study, and our unconditioned response um, is going to be, actually, yeah, let's do fear, okay, or actually, instead of noise, let's do shock, there we go, that's better, okay, so imagine, for example, we have a rat in a cage, and we give it a mild electric shock, okay, that will automatically produce a fear response, but what if we introduce a neutral stimulus? which is a tone, like a little sound, okay? So we have a tone and then, a, and then electrocution. Tone, electrocution, tone, electrocution. Well, over time, the rat's gonna learn to make an association and form a memory that the tone is gonna lead to something bad, right, an aversive stimulus. And over time, the, the tone is gonna become the conditioned stimulus. And the, there we go, the tone, which will lead to a conditioned response of fear. Right? And all of you are like, oh, i got to remember my Pavlovian classical conditioning terms, right? Unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. So this is a nice way to review it, right? That is fear conditioning. It happens with humans, too. We form associations, and we remember it lead to some traumatic events, and that's going to trigger our response as well, okay? All right, now the last function. I'm not going to go too deep in this, but it is important to note. There's a lot of current research to show that your amygdala ju just doesn't deal with fear, right, and negative things, but it actually could deal with positive emotions as well. And you might be thinking, what positive emotions? So there's a lot of current research to show that the amygdala is not just about fear, it's about the intensity of the emotion. In other words, yes, it does respond to fear, but that's because it's a very intense emotion. And we find is that your amygdala will also fire some action potentials if the emotion is very positive, like something really good happened to you, right? You won an award, you got a really good grade, um, you won the lottery, or something really, really big happened. We find your amygdala is also gonna respond to that as well. So I'm not gonna go too, be too deep into it, but it is important to know that there is research coming out that it does play a role in positive emotions. So I guess the big takeaway is that the amygdala is not just about fear, it's the intensity of emotions as well, whether positive or whether they're negative. All right, guys, I want to thank you for watching the Psych Explained video. I really hope you took something away. Once again, don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and to leave your comments below. Until next time.